Hello, everyone. My name is Josh. I am the lead pastor here at Dwarf Hope. And I've been asked to uh, give a little eulogy for Anne, the sweet woman who sat in the front row every week here at Dwarf Hope and would always run up and grab our sheet music after service was over. Um, she was, and you know, I've always, uh, I've always had this, this thing with preaching that it's a very intimidating thing to be asked to give people instruction on how to live an existence that's fulfilling, uh, especially when you recognize that you're an absolute mess every day and you're a lead pastor with a gold front tooth and a throat tattoo. It just, it's hard sometimes. Um, and Anne was one of those people, so I have this kind of rule of thumb. I was a mama's boy, not gonna lie. I like dancing and singing. The only reason I have tattoos is because it made me feel tough, because I was tired of being picked on. But I look for people that kind of remind me of the comfort of my, my nana, my mom, and Anne was one of those faces. It didn't matter how bad my message was. I could look down and she was like, you're doing good. It's so good, you're doing great. She's, um, I'm not sure. You always have an eye closed. I never know. I don't know what that means. Um, but whenever I think you might be sleeping, you always are just like this. I hear you. I just don't want to look at you. That's what it communicates. <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind. Uh, man, you know, it, memorials are... Uh, one of those things as a pastor uh, who started the Door of Hope almost 13 years ago now. And when the church began, it was basically 20-year-olds. Um, so, you know, the first five years we did 75 weddings. And it, it's, it's a challenging thing when we are confronted with the one um, immovable reality for human existence. And that is that the death rate continues to be one per person. That we cannot escape the fact that we will all lose people we love. Um, we have been confronted with the last couple of years, um, regardless of where you stand politically. The fact is, is that we have seen something go through the world that's taken the lives of millions. We've had friends, many of you, once you hit my age, you start losing family members. You start losing friends. I buried, I buried three dear friends in the last eight years from, from cancer. And it's hard. And I think one of the great lies um, that is often communicated about the church is that the church is a place where people pretend that life is not difficult. And I just want to say, as a pastor of a church in a city like Portland, that the one thing that we are committed to at Door of Hope, and I know that it is why I am and Bob have been here, is because we are comfortable acknowledging that life is, not only is it impossible, it's actually quite often terminal. Always, actually. And it's hard to live up. Uh, I should actually say, it's not just hard to live well, it's hard to be honest about the difficulty of living. And the longer we live, the greater the enigma. I think that the mystery of life is a shared mystery, and wherever the human comedy uh, is being told honestly, no matter how varied the lived experience, it is nonetheless a shared experience. And it carries with it universal truths. And I think that these are things that even we, we tend to apprehend more than we comprehend, but our shared stories still have the power to comfort us, remind us we're not alone, even draw us out of ourselves and point us to something bigger, which is the whole point of the gospel. It's not an attempt to escape suffering. It's not even an attempt to give you a definition of why it exists. It's the belief that in spite of suffering that there's a God who's good and that on your worst day he loves you. You know, I think that the thing for me as a man who came to faith at 27 years old, uh, which was later in life after watching my dreams of being a rock star utterly dashed, having been signed to Mercury Records at 22 and dropped at 24, only to find myself working in a record store 
selling my own record out in the used bin. Unlike Anne's brother, I am not the world's greatest songwriter. And my own uh, short-lived rock and roll history proved it. I had the makeup, I had the looks. I, I was Ziggy Stardust without the songs. Um, but the fact is, is that the crushing reality of Dreams Dash is actually the thing that began to force me to ask significant questions about purpose, about what is this about? How do I make sense of the life that I am living? And I, and I began to understand that there is something really powerful about human existence. And it's my unwavering conviction that my life like yours, like Anne's, really matters. And the fact that you're all here to celebrate your life kind of proves that fact. That life is somehow sacred. That there is a mystery involved in it. It's what G.K. Chesterton, uh, one of my favorite uh, English kind of couch theologians, uh, his, his whimsy is infectious, even his greatest critics, he was constantly debating atheists at the time he lived in London, uh, but they couldn't, they couldn't not like him. Uh, the people that, that disagreed with him the most loved the man because the moment the debate was over, he would quickly take him to the pub and he believed that there was a holiness in getting buzzed. Um, it's kind of like Martin Luther that way. Uh, but his, his main, I think, contribution uh, was this belief uh, in this idea that the, that the world is telling the story. And if the world is telling the story, then there must be a storyteller. Even deeper, he, he saw that the world was, what he would prefer to, was full of magic. And if it was full of magic, then there must be a magician. And, and I, I like to take the, that idea and give it a, kind of a theological phrase. It's a sacramental cast. It's the ability to see the beauty and the mystery in existence, even in the mundane. Uh, it's what our greatest poets do, it's what our greatest filmmakers and novelists do, and it is, it's pointing us to something that's big. And I think really it's just three things, and this is all I want us to think about, as we remember this beautiful woman, who like all of us is mixture, who like all of us had her broken parts and her beautiful parts. And in all of it, there's a mystery to that. But the three things that I like to think about whenever I am confronted with my own mortality is this. If there's only one life to live, am I living alone? Our own mortality, our present legacy, and even our eternal destiny. These are the three things that I think are essential. When we think of our own mortality, I'm immediately reminded of the scripture that says in Ecclesiastes, Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die. And that's a, that's a hard thing because it, it immediately raises the question, if we only have one life to live, is it being lived well? But how we define what it means to live a life that is good, meaningful. I know as Christians, one of the great challenges that we are continually confronted with is this fundamental belief. It's the uniqueness of the Christian faith is the belief that Jesus sits uniquely apart from the great religious leaders of world history because religion by its very definition is our attempt to reach God through our own effort. I would say that religion is always represented by a ladder. It's climbing particular rungs, do this, do this, do this, and God will accept you or you will find enlightenment. It doesn't matter what the path is or what the goal is. Religion doesn't even have to have a God at the end of it. In fact, we are all religious people because we all worship, all of us. The question isn't, do we worship? The question is, what do we worship? But I would argue, when it comes to our worship, the question really is, is does that worship actually bring any sort of lasting satisfaction? And I think that when we look at the gospel, we see a completely different symbol that is presented to us. When I think of my own mortality, I am immediately confronted with the uniqueness of the Christian message for unlike the other world religions that we, that, that we have around us, Christianity is the only world religion, major world religion, 
in which its founder is also its content. Christianity is also the only organization in world history that is meant to, it doesn't always do this, but it is meant to exist for the good of those outside of its doors, outside of its walls. But it declares something that is unique. It declares that not only are we mortal, but it, it declares that there is something fundamentally broken in human existence that makes us feel in the depths of our being that we are meant for more. But we also know the futility of trying to find our fulfillment in this world. Lewis, C.S. Lewis refers to it as, he said, it's like the scent of a flower from a place that doesn't exist. It's, it's the, the sense of some deeper meaning that you can never actually get to that thing. One of my favorite authors, David Foster Wallace, explores this beautifully in the, the, the famous speech. I, I hate it because it seems to be the only thing that people read by him when he wrote an 1100-page novel. And the only people, thing people can quote is the 15-page talk he gave at a college before he died. Uh, but in that speech, it is a famous speech called This is Water. And he said, he tells the students at Kenyon, he said, listen, you, if you worship money, you're never going to have enough. If you worship beauty, you'll always feel ugly and die a thousand deaths. Whatever it is you worship will define the, the, the joy of your life. And his only thing he could come up with was that the best thing you could do is, is, is worship serving the good of other people. But there needs to be a bigger drive to it than that, isn't there? There needs to be a source because the same man that spoke that took his own life. Because ultimately his desire to be altruistic did not have any foundation or grounding in something that could keep him breathing, seeing the sacredness, the sacramental cast. His own mortality was too much for him and the best he could think to do was to snuff it out. And I look at a life like Annie and I see something totally different. A person whose foundation was built on something outside of herself and it gave her the ability to deal with illness, her very real mortality. I didn't, even, I didn't even know she was sick because she lived with a continual joy that was unmoved by the difficulties. I mean, not that she, listen, everybody gets scared. Courageousness is not the absence of fear. Courageousness is fear under control. Fear guided by a greater love. And she carried that. Her mortality actually informed what I think is the second most important thing that we must consider, which is our present legacy. When we recognize that life is short, that as it says in James, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. You may disagree with me about God because funerals are like weddings. You just never know what you got in front of you. <laughs> but here's the thing. It doesn't matter because you cannot argue with me about death. And death is a reality that each one of us in this room will be confronted with. And I'm not trying to be macabre. I'm just telling you how it is. It's the fact. It's the, it's the inescapable reality that awaits all of us. But there's a great poem by Franz Wright, one of my favorite poets who died of cancer, and he said, who will teach me to die? Everyone I know is still alive. <laughs> what a profound statement, actually, when we think about it. It is the mystery that we must each face alone. Our mortality brings us to this reality of our present legacy. For anything that kills time, kills us ultimately because time is all we have. I've been confronted with this as a man in ministry. Uh, you know, there's a joke in, in church circles uh, that, you know, if you're a pastor's kid, you're going to be a horrible human being. <laughs> uh, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, Evan's a pastor's kid and he is one of the most exceptional human beings I know. So there's exceptions, but he is human far between. It's true. <laughs> And, 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 and the fact is, is I got two kids, beautiful kids, and one of the most challenging things is maintaining a sense of what is truly important because it's not like Christians are devoid of like doing the wrong thing with their time. I mean, I'm the master of, of doing things that I could be doing, 
than it necessarily should be doing. Uh, it, it's why I'm an incessant dabbler. I like to put a positive spin on it and say I'm a renaissance man, but really it's just that I have an incredible knack for avoiding what must be done, which is giving me an incredible knowledge base about things that actually don't matter. Uh, that makes me what Wallace calls a data mystic, which is a really horrible thing. But the fact is, is that our present legacy, I'm constantly having to remind myself what is actually important because I can lose the sense of that sacramental cast in my ministry. Some of you do it in your work. I was just speaking in California, and this 85-year-old retired therapist came up to me, and she said, can I hug you? And I said, yes, after I was done speaking. I was sharing about my own broken history with my father. And she said, you see that man over there? I said, yeah. She was like, he is a very, very important, wealthy man, and he's my husband. And how I wish he would address the brokenness of his own history. But in his avoidance of his own pain, he has just channeled that toward making more money. Because he can't handle what happened to him when he was a little kid. And you made him cry today, and I want to give you a hug. And I'm like, is that, is that good that I made him cry? Like, I didn't destroy him, did I? Uh, but the fact is, is that, that this present legacy is the question we can hide behind the fact that, my, that many things that we're doing with our time, we, we know that, that it's not being driven by things that actually matter. It's the question of this. It's a painful question to ask ourselves. I asked my father this, who is a man who has lived as an addict and has given himself to drugs and alcohol and chose that over his boys and over family. And I love my dad, and I've been trying my best to build a relationship with him. But he lives alone in a cabin in Alaska. He has no family left. I'm the only one that talks to him. I'm his oldest boy. His dad, his brothers, his sister, they're all gone. And if we were to throw a memorial for our life today, I asked him that. I said, who would come to it? And I realized I would be there. Maybe some of your folk, because I talk about them so much. But the fact is, is that this room is full because there was something about this woman that made an impact on you, that, that touched you. This speaks to her legacy that is not driven by a self-centeredness or a selfishness, but it speaks to a, a woman whose love for people flowed out of her belief that life was actually bigger than her. It was connected to the God that she worships and served and the belief that he loves and could love through her. And it, 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 asks, it causes us to ask the question that we are to be to God as Christians the fragrance of Christ. I like to ask, ask my I asked my dad, I said, oh, do you ever wonder, Dad, like what people say about you when you're not in the room? And he goes, oh, I know what they say. And he does, at least he's honest about that. But I often ask that question, what am I leaving behind me? When I leave a space, are people relieved that I'm gone? Or are they saddened by my absence? That's an important question, and that speaks really to the heart of legacy. You know, it's fascinating to me that every time we see a celebrity that we, you know, that we idolize, you think of Anthony Bourdain, you think of the musicians who have taken their own lives, they, every time a suicide hits the news of a famous person, we are all so disturbed by him. And you know why we're disturbed? We're not disturbed by the fact that a stranger died, that we were attached to emotionally. What we are disturbed by is that people who make it to the top of the food chain got all the way to the top of the stinking mountain and they look down at the rest of us and said, there's nothing up here and then take their lives. And it tells us that the ladder climbing is not going to actually create the legacy that we want. That it is the engagement and the investment in our children, in our friends, in our communities. It's the belief that God has created us for intimacy with himself. I always tell the church, the goal of Christianity is knowing its intimacy with God, not arriving. There is no arrival. We're stumbling toward eternity. That's what we're doing. Which brings me to the final point, our eternal destiny. It says in scripture that 
He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. And I believe with all of my heart, I sat on this ridiculous phone call today in which large Christian corporations are going to invest 10 to 20 million dollars. And if you're a part of this group that I sat on, I'm sorry because it was horrible. Um, and, and they're going to invest a million dollars into advertising um, to secular people about Jesus, that he gets you. And, oh man, I, I just was cringing. I was young. I started swearing. It, it made me sin. Um, uh, I, I, I went, what am I, am I, am I in a bad TV show right now? Because it said, Jesus is a really good brand. That's one of the things they said. But Christianity is it. I'm like, what's this? What's the, what are we talking about right now? Because I'm pretty sure that Christ and Christianity are kind of the same thing. I, like, it's, it's offensive because it calls us to a place that says, you cannot save yourself. And no amount of advertisement or money invested is going to change people's opinions. What changes people's opinions is lives like Anne that says, you matter. That you are loved. That you are not alone in your brokenness. That there's a God in heaven who actually has made our brokenness his problem. And our eternal destiny, I mean, do we really believe that the returning to dirt, and that's the end of it. That you are the outcome of some spectacular, miraculous chance. I think that you mean more than that. Each one of you, I think you mean so much more than that. And what the gospel declares is that God is a God who is not content. He does not need us. But what the scripture declares is that for some mysterious reason, and this is the mystery, he is not content to exist without us. That he loves you. And the invitation that we have in the gospel is that God actually entered into human brokenness. We don't say that Jesus just became a man, that he's just God in some kind of mask, walking the earth, doing good things to give us an example of how we can't live, because none of us can live the way that Jesus demanded. No, what we have is a God who says, you can't climb the ladder, so I'll come down to you. I like to say the gospel is down to earth. And this is why the church should function more like an AA meeting than some sort of sanctimonious BS where we pretend to have our stuff together. In actuality, what we should be saying is that we are a broken people who have discovered that we're loved. That we've discovered that we're loved. That, yeah, we're messes. But we actually believe that God has the ability because he is the divine storyteller. And Jesus is at the center of that story to weave the dissonant notes of human existence, the loss of a loved one, the broken heart, the loneliness, the disappointments in existence. He can weave all of those things into his redemptive story. And he is, whether you're aware of it or not. Your life is going somewhere. The question is, and we are told that every knee, there will be a day when every knee shall bow to Jesus as Lord. And the question is, is, will he be the Lord that you know or the Lord that you have heard about? It doesn't change the fact that he loves you, whether you know him or know about him. He loves you. The gospel is a proclamation of God's love, a love that costs God his own life. I love what Dorothy Sayers once wrote in Creator Chaos. Whatever game God is playing with the human predicament and all of our suffering, he has played fair and taken his own medicine. I leave you with this thought. As you celebrate, but also it's okay to say that it sucks that Annie died. It's okay because it does. Because I'm going to miss her face. I have... Bob with his eyes closed. <laughs> what? I don't even know how to preach on something. <laughs> Listen, guys. Confession is the path to overcoming, not trying harder. Surrender is the path to holiness, not being better. Loving more is the key to fulfillment, not sinning less. 
and intimacy is the goal, not arriving. Famous mystic once wrote, when Moses conversed with God, he asked, Lord, where shall I seek you? And God answered, among the brokenhearted. And Moses continued, but Lord, no heart could be more despairing than mine. And God replied, then I am where you are. That's the gospel. I've been asked to switch hats and Bob said it's going to be music. I actually, Bob, I'm sorry, I kind of lost my voice, so I cut out a song, but I know I saw there were so many songs that it's okay. <laughs> so I'm closing with the song. I was asked to play three. I'm going to do one because you've heard enough for me. <laughs> 